It is surprising how much of Chinese cinema is still so unknown and obscure for viewers outside its borders, especially for the largest part of Western audiences. For a long time now, it appears the surest way of convincing Western film viewers to head to theaters is by the way of martial arts movies, prime examples of successful attempts being films such as Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Hero, Ip Man, or The Grandmaster. At the same time, there are big-budget movies of various genres, which obtained moderate success more recently like The Mermaid, The Wandering Earth, Operation Red Sea, or the animation film Neja, though only the latter achieved numbers close to martial arts ventures in the US market, for example. Still, for the past couple of decades, directors from mainland China, Hong Kong and Taiwan have had recurrent presences and awards in film festivals around the world, earning important prizes in Cannes, Berlin and Venice, of which the most familiar names, at least for more informed viewers, are perhaps Zhang Yimou, Jia Zhangke, Wong Kar Wai, Edward Yang, Tsai Ming Liang, Chen Kaije and Ho Xiaoshen. Of these, one of the most famous for Western audiences will be Zhang Yimou, the director of Hero, House of Flying Daggers, The Flowers of War and The Great Wall, Yet other commercially oriented directors like Ang Lee or John Woo, who've established themselves as filmmakers in the US, will definitely appear more recognizable to most. While films from these masterful directors will be dealt with later on, this video however focuses on an older example of particularly notable filmmaking called Spring in a Small Town, produced in 1948. The film holds today a special place among China's rich film heritage and is considered by many to be one of the finest films of the nation. This rank, however, was established only after a long period of obscurity, since by the time it came out, it was harshly criticized and attacked, which resulted in being ignored and eventually fading into oblivion. The accusations focused mostly on its languorous tone and its so-called narcotizing effect, as well as on the lack of a well-defined political message, especially damning indictment given the tense political atmosphere at the time, as the Chinese civil war headed to its end, with the communists emerging as victors, and establishing the People's Republic of China. The outcome was therefore the film being branded with epithets such as indulgent, decadent, rightist or bourgeois. When a new print was produced by the China Film Archive during the 80s, the film was received by a more sympathetic political climate and obtained the newfound recognition from the audience, which settled the reputation it has today. On the surface, Spring in a Small Town is a plain and complicated film, exploring the dynamics of a love triangle in itself a common dramatic arrangement much surveyed in literature and film, given how easily it is to relate to it. Sporadically narrated by the forlorn yet incredibly suitable voice of Wei Wei, the talented actors playing Yu Wen, the film features only five characters, confined to a small, limited space demarcated by a ruined estate that barely survived the overwhelming destruction from World War II and the Civil War. The characters are mostly circumscribed by the crumbling walls, the overgrown garden, and interiors of the small housing still standing, but this compact abode feels limitless, ample beyond description, when the spotlight turns to and focus on the interactions between the characters, revealing the crest of brimming, hardly contained emotional tsunamis. Li Yan is the patriarch of a family consisting of himself and his wife Yu Wen, his teenage sister Xu, and servant Lao Huang. While Li Yan broods throughout most of the day, oppressed by the dishonorable weight of being the hero of a ruined family legacy, Hugh Wen leaves the homestead to get medicine for his husband's illness, relishing only the moments when she wanders untroubled among the collapsed and derelict city walls. Both barely speak to each other and come across the side of one another for very brief moments of time. This uneventful, mournful state of affairs is wistfully described by Yu Wen when she poetically confesses that she lacks the courage to die, much like her husband lacks the courage to live. However, the visit of Lian's longtime friend, a doctor named Zhang, who went away a long time ago while attempting to escape the nearing turmoil, turns the world upside down, for Zhang is then disclosed to the audience as being an old lover of Yuan, with whom she was involved before meeting and marrying Li Yan. While struggling to harness their rekindled emotions and deep longing, they are torn between the memories of Yor and their friendship and family loyalty with tension building up as time passes, also thanks to Xu's ostensible infatuation with Zhang. Still, between Yu Wen and Zhang, their effervescent passion is expressed through restrained gestures, fleeting glances and muted conversations that quietly hint at their inner volcano at the verge of eruption. Wen is clearly reminded of Qin Jia, 
an influential poet born 2000 years ago, and his poems addressed to his wife when he says that when separation brings 10,000 regrets, rising and sitting, I am unquiet. How am I to express my heart? Another famous Tang poet, Tumu, says in a poem, Love is here, but I can show no signs of love. And before the wine cups, I feel that no smile will ever come. An image that will pertinently reflect the mood of several scenes in the film. Indeed, one of spring in a small town's most striking features is how understated, subdued and naturalistic the performances are from the main trio, yet still expressing restlessness and overflowing with the utmost fiery intensity, a characteristic that will without a doubt appeal to film viewers fond of Antonioni's works, most notably the ones concerning the trilogy of incommunicability, Il Grido and Red Desert. The film is markedly unsentimental, and these much impressive aspects of the film are no doubt aided by the wonderfully elegant cinematography that unhurriedly frames the characters and their environment without resorting to constant close-ups or shot reverse shots, preferring instead to paint regularly a two-shot canvas that allows the scenes to flow patiently in continued takes, highlighting then the many silences that sprout between the sober interactions. Such quiet yet ardent introspections acquiring even more relevance given the almost complete absence of music throughout. Occasionally the camera will gently dolly inwards or around the characters, almost imperceptibly, conferring a sensible but lively, poetical tinge to the scenes. It seems convenient to claim the film will potentially allure also viewers that felt entranced by Wong Kar Wai's work, especially in the mood for love, with which the film shares some similarities at least concerning how melancholically it evokes the sense of unfulfilled passion between two people, how their sense of fidelity keeps them from drowning in one another's arms, all within a dreamy mood of unconsummated expectation. On a dramatic level, the film is surprising for its tactful depiction of emotion and compassionate humanity, convincingly portraying people confronted with divisive moral dilemmas, which although imperfect and suffering the same defects as any other person, are still far from adversarial and bearing little resemblance to typical film antagonists. Li Yan is temperamental and often ill-humored, but cherishes the heartfelt love he has for his wife and ultimately thinks himself unworthy of her. Although Yu Wen is jealous of Xu and Zhang, resentful of her fate and afflicted by temptation, she is submissive and faithful to her husband, without a single harsh word to give in return. Zhang at one point fantasizes about eloping with Yu Wen, but is riddled with guilt just for the mere thinking of it, and is reluctant to betray his friend, inspired by his much stronger friendship bonds shared with him. Such balanced character writing reveals Fei Mu's sensibility as an apt storyteller and a step above ordinary directors with stark black or white views, in turn making Spring in a Small Town a much more compelling view than other larger productions, unfortunately marred by simplistic dramatic dualism or propagandistic overtones. Given the aforementioned description, some will probably guess that Spring in a Small Town is a film that will work as a replenishing, cool stream for the parts viewers looking for movies in the vein of what Mizoguchi crafted throughout his long and masterful career, with The Lady of Musashino, Misoyu, and The Crucified Lovers bearing similar takes on human relationships and the complex emotional exchanges from announced words romantic aspirations. Famous masterpiece is a magnificent, low-key drama of distinguished quality and absolutely worthy of the praise with which it has been showered. Having been produced with meager means and in an exceptional rocky period in history, Spring in a Small Town deserves to be rediscovered by modern audiences around the world, and the best way to do it is to pick up BFI's DVD, which presents a restored version with the best quality available at the moment. As usual, the link will be in the description. Thank you for listening, and see you next time.